is get measurements for my fish as close as I can. This one's still a little froze. Please. Freezer burn or something. From the there's several measurements. The main measurements according to well the well the main measurements will be according to what company you use. But a lot of times right here at the back of this collarbone or this cheek, all the way to the base of the tail is one measurement. And I've got and hold the fish as straight as possible. Looks like eleven. Looks like about eleven and one fourth. Eleven and one fourth. Now that's the length. Now what I'll do, I'll make a bracket. I'll, I'll draw a fish. It's easier for me. And the taxidermy companies will have A, a by B, by, or A times B times C. And a lot of times this is the A measurement from the end of the gill to the base of the tail. Not the end of the tail, but the base of the tail. From the end of the gill to the base of the tail. I had a 11 and 1 fourth. And you just write down exactly what you see. And if you have to make altercations, like stretch him a little bit or something, do that after you get your actual measurements. Always write down your exact measurements, and then you can do all your stretching and stuff. Okay. Now there's another measurement, depending on what company you order your form from that wants from the end of the eye to the base of the tail, from the middle of the eye to the base of the tail. And I've got 15 and a half. Okay. Middle of the eye to the base of the tail. And I'll draw a little uh, bar from the base of the tail to the middle of the eye, a little bracket coming out from the fish. Then I'll put that measurement, write that measurement down. Use the back of the gill to the base of the tail and girth. And a lot of times there's the overall length. Some of them use the overall length and then just the girth. All companies require different measurements. So it's good to, sometimes it's good to cover your bases. If you don't know exactly the measurements from the company you're going to order your forms from, Go ahead and get all these measurements. This is the total length from the end, from the base of the tail, or from the tip, tip of the jaw, all the way to the base of the tail, or all the way to the end of the tail, and then you want to close the tail up, get an accurate measurement. Okay. And then you write that measurement down. This is the total length from the end of the tail closed to the tip of the lower jaw of the mouth with it being closed. And then you get the girth. A lot of times I'll just write that out to the side, just write the word girth and then put equal sign on it. And you want to transfer these notes to your main paperwork or go ahead and write it on your main paperwork. And that's probably even easier. Then you want to find the fattest part of the fish to get your girth measurement. Should be the belly. Okay. A pain of one fourth. Okay. Okay, that was 14. So that was my thick, thickest measurement at, at the thickest part of the belly. I had 14, so I'm going to write 14 now. Okay, I've got a, a fish with a with a that's going to be 14 inches thick. That's going to be a thick belly. What if your customer really wants the pot belly look? What they usually do, <clears throat> they'll sacrifice a little bit of length 
to give him a more, bigger pot belly. In other words, he's got a 14 inch girth. Maybe I'll give him a 15 or even a 15 and a half inch girth. Really fatten him up. But I may have to lose a little bit of length. I may have to, I'll lose about an inch of length. And so keep that in mind. The fatter a fish is, the shorter he is. But he looks better. He looks more fuller and in a way he'll look bigger. He'll look bigger and thicker. And that's what a lot of customers want. Well, maybe an inch, inch and a half, but, uh, and not give them any girth, but I wouldn't do that. Uh, they always want a thick pot belly fish. That's what they want. And so for a company that you plan on ordering your fish body from, make sure you know the measurements they want. And that way, you can order your right body. Okay, now I've just taken some notes here. But if you look, see how I drew, drew the brackets? I guess that's what you call them. How they come out, okay, this is from the end of the lip to the very back of the tail. And that's for a measurement that may call, that, that's for a body that, or a taxidermy company that may require the total length. Now another company may require the base of the tail to the back of the gill. And that's a common measurement. So I've got little brackets made for that. And then I write the measurement in between that space on the brackets. And I've got another one from the middle of the eye to the base of the tail. A lot of companies call for that measurement. <clears throat> and I've got a little space between the bracket for it. Okay, now the girth. I'll just write down my measurement below the girth or to the side of it. And usually the girth and then whatever other measurements it calls for are the main measurements. So, okay, we're going to do a pack mount for a fish, about a two to three pounder. So, first thing we want to do is make a cast of the fish, a half cast. So what we do, we've got sales insulation. We put enough, estimate about how much you need to cover the fish thoroughly. That depends on the size of the fish, too. We're going to have a little bit too much and not enough, I guess. Okay, after we get our cellulose insulation in, which is nothing more than chopped up newspapers, then we get some uh, molding plaster. There's several on the market, but you want to make sure it's a, a plaster of Paris or something like that. Web Pass 90 is real good. And you just want to put where you think it's enough to harden, harden the cast up with. And that should be plenty hard enough. There's plenty in there. Now what we're going to do is put our fish halfway out of the side you want facing down. The best side is the side you want facing down. You know, the best side you want, you want facing up. Sorry. your fish now it's time to do it approximately half the fish it means right up to the fins but not over the fins, but right up to the fins. In it. 
I've got enough to, for where it work. About half the fish under the sand, approximately half the fish. And now I'll show you what we're going to do next. Water, I mean, this is water with no borax or nothing in it. If you get water that's borax, that's got borax in it or something, a lot of times this stuff won't set. Or if it does set, it takes a long time. So just something to think about. All we're doing is mixing up. We want to make a smudgy paste. We don't want it too watery, but we don't want it too thick. We want to be able to lay it on top of the fish and cover the whole fish. Just cover the fish. And if you have to make more, don't worry, just make more. If you've got to. If you got to, you just gotta do what you gotta do. Now the show side is gonna be the side that's getting all the clay on. Eventually, we'll get all that clay off. Then everything will be okay. And the whole tail in the, the, tail in the mount, because there's no need, not really. As long as you get the base of the tail, you know where the tail starts. That's all you need. But I suppose just to be safe, it might not be a bad idea for you to Make sure you get a box or something just to make sure it's large enough for you to put, you know, for your sand and then to put a fish in. I'm just a hair short. It's all right. I'll make sure, sure I make more. Which is just more insulation and more molding plaster. Plaster of Paris or Wet Patch 90, whatever you use. I'm just going to get a little bit more. That's what you like to use. Make sure you put enough in to get the job done. A little bit of water. Gets it in. except for the end of the jaw. But that's okay. Oh, it's better to be able to get the whole fish in. So... It would be in your best interest to go ahead and make sure you do it right first time.
just let it harden anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes would be good depending on what kind of a plaster you have and how fast it's supposed to harden up. Our 10 minutes has passed and what I want to do is probably scoop, scoop under the mold like this, get the fish by the tail or another fin and pull straight up. And keep the fish on the side that it's on and lay your your cast somewhere out of the way. The fish and the side that was in the sand, that's the side that's gonna you're gonna sew on. So you want to go ahead and clip the fin on that side. That's the way I do it. Brush the sand off as good as I can. I can even rinse the fish off if I want to. What you want to do, I've got my fish. Now the side I cut the fin on, the side that was laying on the sand, that's the side you want to cut, is the side that was laying on the sand. So remember I cut this fin off. So now what I do is I get an exacto knife. And right here where the scales stop and the tail ends, I want to cut right up under the scale without going through the tail. And do it as good as you can if you miss, you know, if you don't get it perfect, that's all right. And you can even use your other fingers as a guide, sort of. But as you can see, I'm cutting under the scale next to where the fin rays are. I'm going to do that all the way down to the bottom of the tail. All the way to the top and all the way to the bottom. And I think I've got it good enough. You know what I do? Now you come in with a pair of fish shears or a good pair of scissors. And what you want to do, go straight down the middle. Um, even, yeah, straight down the middle, which is basically the lateral line at the base of the tail. And you work your way up. Now they've got good pairs of shears out there. Go right up the middle until you get to that collarbone. You know that bone right there under the gill? I forget what they call it, the cleathrum or something like that. But you want to have a good pair of scissors to cut through that. So fish shears is a good thing to have. They're pretty strong. And what I've done is I've cut right down through here and the incision between the tail and the scales. I made a cut all the way down, then I made a cut all the way down through the skin, all the way up to this bone, and then I snipped through the bone. Now that's what I've done so far. Okay, now you want to cut under the skin. <clears throat> you want to have a good sharp blade, too. It makes everything easier. But <clears throat> right where the gills end, your, or where your gills, you know your red gills on the inside, right where they end, and the, and the thin skin meets, you want to make an incision. The gills, and where the skin meets, there's a thin flap of skin, you want to cut it off. But you, when you get to the bottom, you want to go as far as you can go and leave it for now. And leave it for now. Now that should be pretty self-explanatory right there. To the bone, and there's thin skin right up under the gill plates. I got as close to the gills as I could. Cut around that way, and then cut around that way. 
as close to the gear, the, the gills that I can get. <coughs> now I've got one of these knives. I guess it's, you call it a uh, skinning knife. I guess it's just got a serrated edge. It's not sharp. It's just serrated. It's good enough for separating the the skin from the meat, and that's what we want to do. Separate the skin from the meat as good as possible. You know, if you don't get it perfect, that's all right, because we're going to be doing a little fleshing later anyway. And you want to get all the way as, as, clo as reasonably close to the skin as you possibly can. And you want to go all the way up until you feel the your knife hit, hit your fin rays, your bones of your fin rays that we haven't cut yet. When you feel your knife hit that, you know you've done good enough. So I can feel it rubbing against the, the bones of these rays that hadn't been cut yet. The spiny dorsal, I can feel the, the bones of the spiny dorsal where they hadn't been cut. And you do this side the same way. Just get it between the skin and the meat as good as possible. spot I should have cut. What we're cutting is that bottom collarbone. I don't know if you can see it. If you can. Right here under this bottom collarbone, right here where the skin is, is a collarbone that needs to be cut because if you don't reach in sideways and cut that collarbone, we'll never be able to separate all this. In other words, the bottom of the collarbone is still together, but I broke it. I cut it. Go back to your skin and knife and get that a little bit better if you want to. So remember, we cut as close to the gill as possible for this reason right here. We can skin all this out, and if we use a form or a pack gun or anything, this skin is still intact at the bottom. Now we're going to go ahead and use our fish shears and start cutting our bones. <coughs> so here at the bottom is a set of bones. And you want to make sure you get under there. You might feel the bones crunching. And if you don't get them perfect, that's all right. We'll go back here a little bit and get it again. And we do the tail the same way. You can kind of feel those bones, and you're, you're, a lot of times you're able to get your shears right up under, and you just snip it off. So cool. So you get what? Then you do the spiny dorsal and the dorsal the same way. Just get up in there and do a base of the tail and just start snipping off. And you do the spiny dorsal the same way.
And if fishing real big, a lot of times you go ahead and snip through the spine while you're up here. Saves from having to do it later, you know. And then you go back to this knife, start getting up under the skin. And you've done separated all the bony areas where they connect to the fish. Start bringing it apart like that. You know, within reason, as good as you can get it. We may not go back over there and get the meat out and get it better. Cut the guts off. The meat's cut enough, you can yank that meat out. Stuff, and I like to get borax. Just put it in there and kind of get rid of some of the wetness a little bit.
clean that out. Same way you'd use a fleshing knife. Same technique. A lot of times, if you put your fingers between what you're fleshing. To help sturdy the skin a little bit. And I suppose it could help you from losing the scale every now and then. All this meat right down here. All the meat's just got to be peeled off the skin. Find you a good starting point and start scraping it off. get as close to the, the bones as I can because there's a lot of meat right there at the base of the bones. And so I'll tend to try to get that out so I don't have to worry about going back and getting it next time. Yeah, and that's on both sides. Thank you. 
hold above this fin joint too. I guess you can cut it also. Well, you probably can't get a real good view of it. Oh, not too bad. And these are those bottom fins on the very bottom. The uh, pelvic fins. This is the base of the pelvic fins. A lot of times there's meat around them too. Sometimes you can get pretty, pretty close to cutting that bone off there. That's about where I need to be. So this is all coming up through this. Sometimes you can use your hand a little bit to help you out. But Basically told me what I got. 
Okay. And in here, I'm going to sniff all this meat, get around all this meat, and sniff it if I can. That's the top of the head. Once on the side, once from underneath where the throat is. And once I can get all that stuff out. Push up on them a little bit. You're not a hole there, too. But I'll show you how to fix that, too, later on in the mounting process. If you do put a hole in it. So it's still not a real big deal. When you're satisfied, this is clean and good enough. Now we're going to move on to the eyes. The eye. I've got my exacto knife. In between the eye and the corner of the eye, I guess you could say the cartilage, 
You go right down the side of the eye and you'll feel a little bit of skin. But you want to cut that all the way around. You cut it all the way around. And it helps have a good sharp knife to do it right. And after you think you've got it good enough to at least be able to pull it out. And you grab your hemos again. Cut off. Now you can go ahead and get your other eye out now too if you wanted to. Okay. Now what you want to do is run. Now what you want to do is run. Go inside the cheek area. And you'll cut above the meat. And then you loop around and try to cut below the meat. You'll feel a bone below the meat. Sometimes you can feel that bone below the meat. Then you use the hemostats, which are an invaluable tool for this. Get up under the skin. Yeah. A lot of times there's meat right up on the uh, on the cheek area. And you when you can pull it away and you'll be able to see uh, see through the cheek into the into the cheek pocket where you're working. Sometimes. There's a silver membrane there. If you leave the silver membrane there, I don't think it's bad. But you at least want to get the meat out. You go all the way down to the groove as good as you can. satisfied you got the cheek good enough, then you do the other side the same way. You get in there and cut below the cheek. All the way to the end. What you're doing is basically separating the skin from the cheek meat with a knife. If it's good and sharp, you'll do a good job. If it's not sharp, you won't do a good job. Then you go in with the hemostats. Pull out that meat. I don't worry so much around this area. Because a lot of that's a, uh, a lot of that is uh, just like white streams or something. But I definitely want to get out of the cheek area. We want to get all that meat out. If you don't get the meat out, when you put the mache in, when you build your cheeks up with the mache, where the meat's at will just shrink down to nothing. Because the meat shrinks down to nothing. But, and then there's no mache there, and you have a big wrinkle there. And it looks pretty bad if you don't do it right. It looks uh, real bad if you don't do it right, actually. get some water and I've got some water. It doesn't take a lot of water. And I just put enough borax where when I mix it in that it doesn't build up on the bottom. Or a better way to say it is it starts building up on the bottom you know after you've saturated the water real good then that means you put enough borax in it. 
It's real easy to waste and put more than what you need to do. I've got a bucket and a little bit of water up to about here. And I've been putting borax in it, just pouring it in. Straight like that. And here again, it's better to have too much and not enough. But when, if it starts building up on the bottom, you know you've got enough in there. It doesn't take much. We need to go back and get some of the meat off after it's been preserved. But I saturated the water and it started building up on the bottom, so I know I saturated the water good enough. And now you let it sit. Now, a lot of people like to wait two or three days, but at least 14 hours. At least 14 hours. What we want to do is go ahead, before we put our fish on, go ahead and make our wood block. Uh, what well, is just a piece of plywood inside that the screw will go through to hold it on the on your driftwood or whatever you put your fish on. And you want to start somewhere behind the the behind the collarbone or behind the gill. And looks like this one. I'll extend this one out to about the uh, soft dorsal, I guess. So uh, looks like I've got about about four by and you don't want to go all the way out to the end you want to just get close enough where you know you're going to shoot the screw through it so it looks like four by four by three and a quarter looks pretty good <clears throat> so i'm going to cut my piece of wood about four inches by three and a quarter inches now bandsaw would be great or a jigsaw or or anything just to go ahead and cut your plywood out Okay, now after your fish has been in the borax, you might have borax on your fish. You want to rinse that off with good, good cold water. Okay, now what you want to do, so we already got our wood piece. We cut it out three and a half by four. I just mark it off with a pen and cut it out with a jigsaw. And after you're pretty at it, pretty, pretty fair, you got out most of the scales that you wanted to get out. Or you, that you've got your detail pretty well right to what you want. Then you want to make sure everything is where it's supposed to be anatomically. You want it to match up with the uh, with the cast you made. And that matches up pretty good. I think it's pretty close. We made the mold. We're going to go ahead and stuff the inside of the fish. Now we got our plaster of Paris again, our web patch 90. I'm going to put enough in that I know it's going to get good and hard. Now they've got stuff out there that sets slower and they've got stuff out there that sets faster. So be careful. Make sure you use what you want to use. And now you want to make sure you get clean water. So once you've made sure you've got clean water, you go ahead and pour it in and start mixing it up. You want to make sure you put enough hot hardener. You don't want it soggy because then it'll break apart when you're trying to uh, put the fish together. In other words, you want to put enough hardener. And just mix it up with whatever means is at your disposal, however you want to mix it. Mix 
messed up, you start putting it in with a spatula or anything else you might want to use. And depending on the brand you use, it'll determine how much time you have. Some stuff you may have more time than other stuff. So that's something to think about. When you're worrying about speed, you know, how fast you need to do this stuff. Some of this stuff hardens pretty quick. Some of it doesn't harden fast at all. The temperature, you know, the temperature of the air and everything plays a part. But I'm going ahead and building up my outer extremities first. I want to go ahead and do that. Now some of the other stuff they got out on the market may be better than this stuff. Go ahead and get your wood piece in or where you want it. You want it just behind the gill and you can kind of mash it in there. And that may even help take some of the if you got places that look like they're indented a little bit, that'll even take some of that out. Make sure you push in around the scale areas if you got to make more. You don't want it to. You don't want it to look bad. working time of some of this by putting a little borax in it. Then again, you don't want it to where it'll never harden, so best is control how much you put in it, but some of this stuff dries pretty quick, almost too quick. You know, right down here in the throat area, Remember, this is the back side, but still, right here in the throat area, it looked like a place where the skin should have came around to the other side and mashed up a little bit. And right now, it is soft enough. We can do basically anything we want with it right now. I'm going to try to cover the piece of wood if you can. In any other loose fitting places, it'll turn into wrinkles. So I've really got it watered down real good, and I got it that way on purpose, really. Because we don't want a lot of wrinkles. Sometimes it's good to make it a little bit meshy, I guess you could say is the right word. And we want to be able to squeeze out the excess.
Now remember, this is the real soft stuff, and we've got a little bit more time to work with this stuff than we do some of the other stuff. It's not, it's not hard to not make enough, that's for sure. But before it starts hardening, you want to make sure at least the bottom the extremity is smooth. in here you don't want it too thick and you can almost squeeze it together in places and get what you want smooth but you don't necessarily want it uh covering everything. Don't worry about so much about little wrinkles on the back so much as on the top and the sides. some more up. If you have to use your hands, do it. But I, the first place I concentrate is getting that skin to tuck up into the cheek or getting this uh, fish fill to tuck up into the cheek. That's my, that's my number one goal. Before I just pack the eye, that's what I want to do first. Is make sure I get that stuff up in the cheek. However I have to. However it is, I've got to do it. I might have to get a little screwdriver or modeling tool or anything, pack that stuff into where I know it needs to go. Pack them too, you don't want to do that. But if you got ample working time, you can mount the fish on a stick or something and go ahead and, you know, if you got too much, you can squeeze it out by mashing the cheek you know, in a uniform manner and get it to squeeze out of the eye area. But I think that's pretty good. Now, now we're going to do the other side. I think it's hard enough that I can go ahead and turn the fish over and take the mount over like this. We want to get it in there and 
When we put it in, we want, we want to concentrate on getting it up into the cheek area first. You know, while it's still good and soft, you know, we want to make sure we match in every corner of the cheek that we can. And this stuff starts, starts getting hard pretty fast. And I suppose your finger could be good enough. But you want to make sure you have a good packed cheek, in other words. Then the last thing you can worry about is the eye. Okay, what we're doing here, we're going to go ahead and get all the excess sand off our fish. So I just got a uh, fur bottle. I guess any kind of soft rag or something, but I just to make sure I got all the sand off my fish. And if your hardener is still soft, you can go ahead and use it and finish doing your, your eye your eye socket, your cheek area and your eye socket. Maybe the first or second spine, a lot of times the second one. Uh, you can get a little bit of meat, a little bit of the fin, you know, as you're going down, and a little bit of the meat. Push the fin forward and go straight down into the mount, you know, through the mache. You know, you may use a styrofoam body. I probably could have showed you how to use a... This is just one way. This is a pack mount. For a fish it's three to four pounds and littler, it's pretty good, pretty good. But anything over three or four pounds is starting to get heavy. And you probably want to opt for a different method. So I went through the skin a little bit. And I'm going into the mount, and I'm going to pull that spine forward. And what that does, that holds the that holds the spine forward. You know, the spine on the pin. It holds it forward while it's drying. The same way. Tail can be a little tricky sometimes, so you want to be careful with it. I go where the first, I guess about the first ray that comes out, sometimes you want to kind of estimate how you want it spread. Yeah, about like that. About right. stuff like this too. But you can go in from the front too, you'll just have to cover up your hole later. Bottom one the same way, just make sure you have some good sharp pins. you have a good point on any of your pins. And anatomically, you already kind of know how they go. So you just want to replicate that. You 
And then you do the other one the same way. about like how you want them. Once you get them, then you, uh, you got one more fin to do. Now, a lot of times, now you don't necessarily have to, but on this one, I'll use a thinner diameter can to basically because that's all I need. That's the only reason. But I'll get about to the Almost to the last spiny ray up here, and then I'll dab a pin through, like, like so forth. And you don't want a fin, the fin to stick to the body on the middle, I don't want it to do that either. Now I get another one and go, go right about to the bottom. Folks have a good, clean can, one that don't have any rust on it. Then you get to one of the bottom ones. And so forth. And then you can determine how far you want the fan out. And I want it about like that. You can just use regular paper clips. On occasion, I have used like clothes pins. Either one would be fine. What you want to do is get you some of this screening material, like this. You can get it at Walmart or anywhere, just kind of a screeny, plastic screening material in the craft section. What you want to do is go back behind each pin and outline it. It doesn't have to be perfect on the screening material. Outline it with a sharpie pen, cut it out, and do a front and back. Do a front one and a back one. And once you do that, put your screen material on. You want to make sure your fins stay wet, if at all possible. You should hopefully have everything spread out pretty good for you. But as the fish dries, it has a tendency to want to wrinkle. And when you put screen material on it, like this, as the fin dries, it won't be able to wrinkle that way. Just like I've done this one. Get your piece of screen material, cut out a front piece and a back piece. And you can even trim the fin pretty close if you want it to get pretty close to the fin. And you do all the fins that way, and then I'll show you how we do the gills. Do the spiny dorsal the same way. Popsicle sticks before, believe it or not. Just put them long ways, just keep the spine good and straight. But the screening material should be adequate enough. You think you might need. But you do all the fins that way, and then you just clip them on. Okay, just like I've done on my other ones, I cut me out a piece that matches the gill. I just stuck a piece under the gill, went around it with a sharpie pen, and I outlined how my fin's supposed to go. Okay, that looks pretty good like that. Clips and Flip it on. I don't worry about doing it double on, on, on these, on the gill. That'd be hard to do, except on a bigger fish. So that's done. Now I'll show you what we're going to do next. On bigger fish like bass, I've I've used sponge material, anything to just kind of keep the gills separated. 
Sometimes it's separated good enough, you don't even have to mess with this. But a lot of times you got to separate the gills. Because I have a tendency to want to... Uh, and as far as what, what you use to separate the gills with, uh, you let the size of the fish kind of help you determine that. On this, I'm just using uh, pieces of... Uh, strips of uh, uh, like jumbo popsicle sticks. I'm just cutting two and putting them on top of each other and then using this to just keep the gill separated while it dries. But there again, sometimes you can, they're separated all by themselves. So here again, you got to let your, kind of, what's happening at the moment, you got to let it kind of dictate what you need to do. And I'm just separating all the gills. with some popsicle sticks. A lot of gills, and they want to see something more than just a, uh, a bunch of gills clumped together without being separated. So I try to do that for them. I try to give them something a little more. Now the fish is dry, and what you want to do is, when you take these screens off, the screen material off, you just want to be careful that you don't accidentally tear the uh, fin somehow. Now you don't want to put the fin, fin in a bind. Uh, it's better to be safe than sorry. You just want to operate a little bit of care and you can even take the pins out. You may want to take the screening out first, then your pins. And you just do all your fins that way. You just want to be careful. You tear a little bit of the fin that way. So you just want to exercise just a little bit of caution while you're doing it. Same thing here. You just want to make sure all your clips are off. And if you're in a position where you think, well, sometimes you think you can just yank it off, but sometimes you do accidentally tear the fin, so you just have to exercise caution. And you do all your fins this way. And then you can go back and pull your pins out. And you don't want to do this too early. You want to make sure everything's good and dry. If you take the fins, if you take this material off before the body of the fish is dry, sometimes your fins will still wrinkle. So you want to make sure he's good and dry. You can, in other words, you can take the material off too quick. And even though the fins look dry, the base of the fins aren't dry. And when you take the screen material off, you can still get some wrinkle in your fins. how we done these. I just did it on the inside. Uh, usually the clips don't show so bad on the outside. They don't show anywhere where the scales are. And then you just take it out. Now you can do this. In this case I used uh, an old uh, cigarette carton box and it seems to be pretty good cardboard. It, that you can buy from the taxidermy company. You can buy some clear stuff. And there's just so many different ways. But all I did was put the cardboard behind the tail, trace out the tail reasonably close as possible. And I did all my fins that way. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a coat of glue on this before I even cut it out. I like to put glue on it because if you cut them out and put glue on them or contact cement on them, Seems like they want to stick to your hands or fall on the floor or it's hard to get them to let go of your fingers because the glue sticks to your fingers. So I go ahead and glue them while they're still connected and then I just cut them out after they're already got a coat of glue over it. And I put one on this, I put one coat on, on, the, on the cardboard 
Now I put one coat on the back of the fins, and you can even put two on the cardboard and two on the back of the fins, and let it dry for about, let it get semi-dry, where it gets tacky, and then you just touch them together and it, it connects and stays. And you just want to put a coat on the back of the fin that you're going to card. Make sure you get a good coat on there. And one should be sufficient. And you do it to all your fins. Just one good healthy coat of contact cement. And like I said, you can even let it dry and go back over with another coat. Usually once on this and once on the once on the fin and once on the cardboard, a lot of times that's been good enough for me. I've had no problems with it adhering real good. You know, as long as you use a good contact cement, you shouldn't have a problem, in other words. Stuff for backing the fins. They got fin backing cream. They've got a lot of stuff. Pot. Now, if the fin's in real good shape, like on the body or something, or on the side of the body, or even the bottom fins, a lot of times if they're in real good shape, I'll leave them alone because they add some transparency to the mount. You know, the fins, if they're a little transparent. A lot of times you can put a little pearl on there, you know, and then mist a little bit of green on there. And it makes for a real dynamic looking mount if, if, they're, if the fins are a little bit transparent. Adds to the realism of it. But if they're damaged, uh, just don't fret it any and go ahead and card them. Line this stuff on. And I just go ahead and put a coat on here like this. Just make sure you get it everywhere on the tail. And make sure you use a good contact cement. There's some stuff out there that doesn't even work. Um, DAP has a good contact cement. And there's even some smaller cans that you can get that have automatic brush built in. That Some of those are pretty good. You know, a brush built onto the lid. And some of that stuff's pretty good too. What I'm do is I'm just gonna lay it down, and let it dry. And this contact cement doesn't take long. Now you can give it five to ten minutes and go get you a drink or something, or go do something else. Glue's dried. And now what I want to do is just simply cut them out. Just follow what I've cut out. And you want to follow what you outlined, and depending on how good you outlined, if you loosely outline, that's okay as long as, you know, you can always trim the cardboard off with a razor later, which is what we're going to do. So now we're just cutting out, you know, just like you did when you were in elementary school, just cutting stuff out, and that's all we're doing. We're cutting out the outline of the fin that has its glue already on it. You want to be as careful as you can when you connect them together because once you connect them, that's pretty much all she wrote. They're there for the count. So you want to be as careful as you can. You want to be as careful as you possibly can because once you connect them, that's all she wrote. Now this bass, it's actually been stripped down and I'm just repainting it for someone. But it had some damaged fins. And sometimes when you damage a fin, a good way to fix it is just to recard it. You know, put a card behind it and then get you a little caulking or something. And with a brush you can fill in the cracks, you know, where it may be bent and cracked on them. 
And even at the end, if there's some fin damage, a lot of times you can, with the strokes of your brush, a lot of times you can imitate fin rays. And that's the idea about, behind a lot of people uh, doing that. Put all my fins in, then I go ahead and trim the cardboard edges off the fins, and you've got a smooth, straight looking fin. Or scissors if it sticks out far enough. A lot of times I'll go back with scissors and then a razor blade and do any, you know, finite trimming with the razor blade. Okay, now what you do, after it's good and dry, you just go through and... Now if you were doing this by yourself, you might hold it by the stick where you can turn the fish and get at it any way that you need to. Now the closer you get with the scissors, that's good, but remember we're going to go back with a razor to do our final trimming. This is just maybe of the cardboard that we left. There's supposed to be a curve. You don't want no sharp edges. Now you go ahead with a razor to do your final trimming. And what you want to do, you just want to run it flush up against the fin, maybe even a little bit at a, a little bit behind the fin. You know, at a, a downward angle behind the fin will ensure that you get the cardboard off where it's not going to show from the front. like that and you're just trimming it right up to this to the edge because you don't that you want a smooth round contour that's a lot of times better suited with the scissors but the best example because this fin is in pretty good shape but you can see a little bit of a torn area there now imagine this being even worse you know maybe even part of the fin off you get a little bit of caulk Latex caulk and get you a little bit of water. Maybe put it on the brush. You want to thin it down. You may want to bring it this way a little bit. Now what you're doing, you're good at, you're ending up making if it was a big tear, see the brush itself, the the, the bristles of the brush will actually make your uh, fin rays. And so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to get a little bit of latex caulk. And get a little bit of water. Wet the brush down. Maybe a little bit on there and be okay. And let the water saturate the caulking for, for a little bit just to soften it up. It don't take long. Just a few seconds. And back in. And as I said earlier, you can even use real, you know, fins to do some of the repair work. You know, pieces of real fins off of other fish. You know, fins you don't use. Maybe fins that are on the back side that aren't seen, that are on the...